So we're in Revelation 15, and, um, and so the title of the message is uh, Two Groups, Part 2, because I didn't get a chance last week to finish it. So uh, we're going to be in the same place. And so let's just begin with prayer. Lord, I thank you for today and just for uh, loving us. Thank you for the word that's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Uh, we thank you that you're a present help in time of trouble. And, uh, you know, it seems even when we're the cause of the trouble, you're there, Lord, to minister to us, uh, to do what's necessary, um, to pick us up, to dust us off, to carry us on. We thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for your grace that we can embrace. We thank you for your love that we can share. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you, Lord, for your promises and uh, and Lord we anticipate uh, your soon and very soon return for us and in the midst of a crazy world Lord we just trust in you and so thank you that we can gather today <clears throat> and we can encourage one another and um, in fellowship so we lift up again this study, pray that we would uh, have hearing ears in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, in chapter 15 of Revelation, there's uh, two groups that are represented in this chapter in what I call, um, you know, when, when, I, when I consider really these kinds of things, there is a chapter in Hebrews that I call the Hall of Faith chapter. And uh, in that uh, chapter, we see that some believers have a testimony of experience a miraculous deliverance in the physical realm. And yet, there's other believers that are viciously killed uh, but yet, the Bible teaches ultimate victory. And we'll see that in this chapter. But I want to read that Hebrews 11 chapter, verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Now others, now these would be other strong, faithful believers, were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection, or of course, an everlasting resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so we have their testimony. And I just uh, am so encouraged by that, um, you know, that record. Because, you know, there uh, we see some believers just experiencing things differently, which we all do. And how terrible it is is when somebody believes, oh, you're experiencing that because you have sin in your life, or 
You don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you know, these things. Just all this false doctrine that's out there. Well, you know, sometimes God works through the very difficult things. And so we don't know how things on earth will play out. But what we do know is how things will work out after. You see, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And so we're able to live our, our lives in confidence because of that understanding. And one thing is for sure, God gives us peace. His clear word of prophecy to us, like we're studying in the book of Revelation, brings us comfort and confidence. The word tells us in 2 Peter 1.19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Now, can anyone guess what that dark place would be? And um, yet this dark place that we're in, we're called out of. Before you were a believer, you were a ch a children of darkness. But now you're children of the light. And so we're in a dark place, but we're children of light. And so, and so we're to be uh, a church like a city on a hill. We're to be different so that others who are in the darkness can see the light and be drawn to it and then be saved by our testimony. And so we have in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have written prophecies that are detailing the last days. Now, Jesus, in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, give many of those details, but reading just two verses, Jesus said in Matthew 24, so you also, when you see all these things, Know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And I believe the Bible teaches us that we're that generation. But, you know, Jesus says, when you see all these things. And so, in other words, Jesus is saying that these end time scenarios are not going to be hidden. They're going to be something that we can see. And of course, um, unbelievers will see them as well, but they'll interpret them wrongly. But believers should be interpreting these things correctly. Now, ama amazingly, our generation can understand how many of these end times prophecies can happen. They're not just symbolism, like so many commentators from history, believers, spirit-filled, and everything would see these prophecies and scratch their head and think, how can that happen? And now with technology, we go, oh my goodness. It is so easily understood how so many of these prophecies can take place. And so as we race forward and the end is near, as we see things lining up and they're more obvious than ever before, we remember that God is previous. Isaiah 42, 9, it is written, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So that describes prophecy. In Isaiah 46, God says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet, uh, yet done, saying... 
my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And so there's none like God. Only God can give an accurate detail of events that have yet to happen. And so then in uh, John 13, 9, the New Testament, this is after the, the upper room, the supper, and Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He says, now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. And so Jesus really gives us one of the purposes for prophecy. So when those things come to pass, we go that we, we, many would come to saving faith. And many of us that already believe, we just are emboldened in our faith because of fulfilled prophecy. And so here in our text, in chapter 15 of Revelation, there is, if you will, a break in the weather of judgment. And before the final bold judgments that are described in chapter 16, in chapter 15, God cries out by the angels that men would repent. Jesus did the same as a perfect representative of the Father, where he declares in John 7, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now that reveals the heart of God for those who reject him. We have seen that all the way through the Bible, that God cries out to those who reject him. And so this may be hard for us to realize or relate to when it comes to the long suffering of God. But what we have to understand is God knows each person and is calling out to them and desires them to know him. And through this process where we might get frustrated and where we might say, how long, oh God? He's being so successful, wooing them. And they're coming to faith. So God knows. And like we would want a loved one to change, God much more wants these people to change. And as a parent, when would you pull the plug? So God has in mind those, that last one who will repent. Does he pull out any sooner than that? No. So that helps me to accept what I don't understand and I cannot change. I trust the Lord. Second Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that's God's heart. A scripture I think I read last week, Ezekiel 33:11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? In other words, house of Israel, I have revealed myself to you. I have given you my word. I have been your deliverer. I have been faithful. Why should you die? Turn, turn from your wicked way. God does not show partiality. God in a personal way is ministering to this person and that person by his spirit 
through events, through circumstances, through creation. And so in this chapter, looking at verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And so he says, I seen a sign great and marvelous. Well, I would imagine any sign or vision that we would see of heaven is always would be great and marvelous. The number seven that's used there for angels and for plagues is not a random coincidental number, but it is selected as it has been through the book of Revelation to speak of a number of completion. And as it says there, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Teleo is the Greek word, and it means to reach an end or an aim. And so Jesus gives clear meaning to that word teleo in the Greek in John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine as he hangs on the cross, he said, it is finished, or teleo, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And so that's the same word as I've completed completely what I set out to do. And knowing that the last prophecy that needed to be fulfilled was fulfilled as Jesus gave up his spirit. Nobody took it from him. He gave up his spirit. And then in verse 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. And so we see here that this speaks of the first group that has had victory over the beast. Now, although the, the scene that is described here is described of those martyred saints, martyred in the tribulation, and yet it depicts ultimate victory <clears throat> as they're standing in heaven, worshiping the Lord, having victory. You notice it says over the image, the mark, and the number. <clears throat> because they would have to have resisted in the great tribulation those things that would have, uh, by accepting, showed a, a allegiance to following the beast. Sort of like, hey, put on this uniform, wear it with, with pride or whatever. Uh, and so, but they resisted that. And so now they're in heaven. They're singing a new song, the song of Moses, verse 3, and the song of the Lamb, representing the, just like the Old Testament uh, where God delivered his people, and in the New Testament, there was God delivering his people. It would be the same song of deliverance because it was the same deliverer. God's people in the Old Testament, God's people in the New Testament, the great tribulation saints would have received that same experience, that same power of God in whatever it is that they would go through. They sing uh, the, the song. And now make note regarding this song. They sing of the works of God. They sing of the ways of God. And they sing of the worthiness of God. This is worship in heaven. But notice that this would represent, if you will, pure worship. The pronouns being the your is used four times. You know, your works, your ways, your name, your judgments. And the pronoun you used three times where it says, who shall not fear you, 
You alone are holy. And then lastly, we worship before you. And so these martyrs in heaven, these who were delivered, these who had the victory focused on God. They did not focus on their own costly sacrifice. I think that's key. This is surely the heart of true worship. It's all about God and not about us. We look to his accomplishments, not ours in worship. We glorify him. We turn our attention to him. I think there's a big clue there. Beware of that. And so they rejoice because they were delivered Verse 5, after these things, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chest girded with golden bands. And so... This describes the horrific effects that the second group described in the next chapter where the final bold judgments are poured out and those that receive wrath and judgment rather than deliverance. This is the second group. And so the second group is the reality of God's wrath against all those who choose not to follow Jesus. And then you see in verse 7, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. And guess what Greek word that is? There in the very last word of that chapter, it is teleo. So at this stage, there will be no more altering, no more delays. God's word will continue to move forward and nobody was to enter the temple. And so, you know, we have that word teleo. And it's uh, interesting because it, this, these things won't happen until the last one comes to faith. You know, and I've heard that in all the years that, you know, I've been a believer. We're not going to get raptured until the last believer comes to faith. Jesus didn't say it was finished on the cross until the last prophecy that needed to be fulfilled was fulfilled. And it's interesting because even in um, the record here, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Then a white robe was given to each of them, speaking of the, the tribulation saints in heaven, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. I wonder what that Greek word is. It's teleo. Not until the very last tribulation saint standing for the Lord would stand, it wasn't until then that the great tribulation would be over. And so when the last prophecy was fulfilled, Jesus said it was finished. When that last martyred tribulation saint came to faith, Jesus comes back. And, you know, it's interesting because the rapture is not going to take place again until that last believer 
comes to faith. And when the millennium, millennial reign starts, it's a thousand years, you think like, Lord, when is this, you know, going to be over with and we're just going to be in heaven for you forever? Well, we think in terms of, you know, year and days and minutes and hours. And, and you know, a thousand years is a day to the Lord and a day is a thousand years. So we have to break free of the fact that we don't co really conceive time as time is. We're in a temporal realm. So God moves from the great tribulation into bringing us into the millennium reign where there's a reign of righteousness for a thousand years and many are going to come to faith. They're going to be born. Is God supposed to erase that whole thousand years? You know, and having perfect knowledge, never come to relationship to those that would be born? Absolutely not. I mean, if, if I had foreknowledge, you know, would I say, okay, this child is our last child, no more. You know, after our second, let's say. <laughs> we have five. Well, I wouldn't do that. If I had perfect knowledge, I'd go, oh, Elizabeth's still coming. Oh, Joe's still coming. Oh, Sarah's still coming. Well, let's just wait. You know, we had, we had hit four decades with having kids. We had one in the 70s, one in the 80s, two in the 90s, one in 2000. Well, along the way there, you know, we would have our 10-year-old thinking, hey, do we have a little bit more freedom now. You guys stay at home. We're going to go do something. And then Elizabeth pops up on the scene. Oh, my goodness. Okay, we're starting over. And then Elizabeth and then Joe and then, uh, oh, six years goes by. Hey, we have a little bit of more freedom again. We're going to go do something. Oh, and then Sarah pops up. Oh, we're starting all over again. So, you know, I mean, it'd be real easy to say, well, Lord, what are you doing? But think in terms of, no, those that are going to be still coming, that we're going to love and we give our very lives for. And, you know, don't be so, you know, selfish in our way of thinking. Because, hey, if we have to endure something here for the sake of somebody coming to faith, so be it. That's what this whole life is all about. Living for others, or it should be. Not for ourselves. What can we take with us? You know, you've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse. Um, although the Egyptian kings would have their whole, you know, thing buried with them. Um, but that's a false way of thinking. But it's just the idea that eventually that day will come. And so we can still choose today to follow Jesus and to trust in his finished work that will carry us through not only today, which Jesus says, by the way, there's enough trouble today. Don't be worrying about tomorrow. I love that simple counsel. And how often do we complicate it? You know, as I mentioned, what was it? I think last week again, uh, and I mentioned, hey, Oh, I won't worry about tomorrow, but what about the day after? <laughs> you know, what about that day? No, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. There's enough today. And you know, so if we follow his counsel, we're not going to be all anxious about tomorrow. And so, um, you know, so let's trust the Lord and his word and enjoy the fact that, you know, his timing is perfect. Uh, receive that uh, ahead of time. And, um, you know, you know, be, be that one that can wait in a long line. I know some here that can't, by the way. <laughs> I know some that go home if there's a long line. I know some who avoid places because there's long lines. I know some that, you know, do, do they, you know, uh, when I was in Southern California, I'm almost done here, when I'm in Southern California, we used to have to fight the traffic. So I spent two to three hours on the road and then worked my, you know, eight to ten hours. And, they, and the two hours to three hours on the road was sitting in traffic, bumper to bumper. And that was hopefully that because it wasn't an accident. And so um, I did that for a lot of years from 75 to when I come up here in 92. It's a lot of years. It's a lot of years to come up here and all of a sudden appreciate that that doesn't exist. But if that's not where your experience is, 
you could sit on 97 and be all irked because you missed the light <laughs> because there was too many cars in front of you. You're not thinking straight. You know, you're not relating correctly. You know, um, there is no traffic around here. Nothing's far. You know, on a normal day, it'd be like me driving to Burns to go to work. So let's try and chill and trust the Lord a little bit, you know. If you're in a long line, I remember, I remember uh, we're, we went to get pizza one time. We were down in Southern California. And we were waiting for a long time. And we were on our way to church. We were going to pick up pizza before we went to church. And we're on our way. I mean, just waiting, waiting, waiting. And I'm just like kicking back. and thinking like, well, whatever, you know, just uh, trying to, you know, go with the flow. To come to find out, they just never even put our order in. And so I just remember the whole lesson. And so who am I going to get mad at? I mean, you know, to me, it's real easy that God could have worked out the whole situation just to show us whether we're, how we're doing. He puts us in places where he, when, when we just snap, think, well, okay, you're not doing very well. Or, hey, I'm calm, all right, whatever, chill. Hey, you're doing okay. Because, the, because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. If you just snap all the time, you know, you're not doing very well. But if you can chill because you know God's worked out your schedule, you're doing good. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand together. If you need prayer, come on forward here. There'll be somebody right here to pray with you. Lord, uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. We thank you for all the end times details, Lord, that we can be given, um, that we can share, that we can have confidence in. And we just ask that you would continue to be glorified in our lives, in this church, in this forever family. Lord, we thank you for eternal life, the promise that you have given to us and that you have signed, sealed, and delivered by your great sacrifice for us. We thank you, Lord, that, that we can have that close relationship with you. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. We thank you that, uh, Lord, if we confess our sins to you, that you are faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for that. I pray that all of us would keep in that place of re having repented hearts towards you. And uh, Lord, just to receive your grace every day as we reset, and we pick up our cross and we follow you daily. To, to, to do those things that you have shown us that are according to your will. And each of us in our perspective places, uh, ministering to different people. I pray, Lord, that we would be a faithful witness and that we'd have a good testimony, that we wouldn't be sideways on our thinking because we're comparing what you're doing in our lives with what you're doing in somebody else's lives and that we would not imagine evil against our brother, but, Lord, that we would pray, that we would be steadfast, and that we would continue in the faith. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.